I get started. <laughs> you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Berks Alliance Spotlight. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Colbrookdale Railroad. Um, some of you may be very familiar with the Colbrookdale Railroad. Some of you may think you're very familiar with the Colbrookdale Railroad. And some of you, this may be the introduction to it. I think we're going to learn a lot of very, very interesting things and sort of the future of where the railroad's headed. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to John Weidenhammer for a quick moment to do a welcome on behalf of the Berks Alliance. John. Hi, Dave. Thanks so much. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our Spotlight series for uh, today. Uh, we kind of have a, a presentation from uh, what is one of Berks County's uh, best destinations. Uh, and I say that uh, as a proud board member of the Colebrookdale Railroad. So I have to kind of give a disclaimer here, but I just want to thank uh, Dave and uh, Shannon for helping to set up the presentation today. And I want to thank our presenters from Colebrookdale, uh, Nathaniel and um, I'm guessing Michelle will have a role in this uh, for their efforts to put together the, the presentation. But I do recommend that if you haven't been recently to the Colebrookdale Railroad, that you take a moment to, to, to do that because it really, this time of the year, it's a great trip and a, a great way to uh, see the, the Secret Valley in, uh, in Boyertown. Also, I just wanted to mention that uh, for those of you who maybe are just tuning into our Spotlight series for the first time, that the, uh, the Berks Alliance is a collaboration of anchor institutions in Berks County. And we have a focus on community development with an expectation that we will work to improve the health, wealth, and education attainment of the community of, of Berks County. So Dave, with that, I'll let you take it away. And thanks again to our presenters. Thank you, John. And once again, welcome. Uh, we ask that you uh, mute your microphones while the presentation is going on, but that you keep your cameras, that you put your cameras on uh, so we can see we're dealing with live people. Uh, we will go through the presentation. Nathaniel and Michelle will run us through the presentation that they've given us, which I think you're going to find very interesting. We ask you to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to raise questions or share your comments. Uh, with us. We will get to those once the formal presentation is done. Um, as as uh, we've mentioned in the past, we record this, we post it on the Berks Alliance website, we share it with BCTV, and we send a copy of the video to everybody who registered for the event. So you can uh, spend some time looking at it again if you'd like. I want to thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nathaniel Guest, who is the CEO of the Colbrookdale Railroad, among other things. Thank you, David, and thank you, John, and thank all of you for uh, joining us today, and, and thank you to the Berks Alliance for the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, which is the Colbrookdale Railroad, um, and in my former profession, uh, I was an attorney, so I was paid by the word, so uh, I'm going to keep a, a watch on the clock, and if I, if I go on uh, too long, uh, we'll, we'll just end wherever we're at, so we leave some time at the end for questions, uh, so uh, with that, um, I thought I would go ahead and start with orienting uh, where we're at in, in space and time. So um, the, the maps uh, on this uh, slide show the location of the Colbrookdale Railroad. We, we, we run along uh, the valley of the Ironstone and Manitoni Creeks where the latter meets the Schuylkill River. Uh, it's an area where Berks, Montgomery and Chester all meet. Uh, can you all hear me okay, by the way? Okay, good. Um, and though it straddles these three uh, counties, uh, the region it serves really is distinct. It has its own identity and its own history, uh, and, and that history and identity can, can really be um, summed up in one word, and that word is iron. It was literally and figuratively iron that built the Colebrookdale Railroad. The Native Americans who lived in the, in the area that, that uh, we now call the Secret Valley that uh, John referenced, um, found the mountains in this region to be sacred uh, for the magical properties that they had. And one of those magical properties uh, we would call magnetism. The uh, mountains surrounding what is now the Colebrookdale Railroad uh, have a, a magnetic iron ore, uh, which the Native Americans held to be sacred, uh, but also it made that iron ore 
easy to find by early iron pioneers who came here to establish their industries, uh, such as the Colbert Vale Iron Company, uh, shown uh, here in the photograph. And uh, this is an area that you may see in a later slide, uh, what it looks like today. This picture is from a, um, the latter part of the first decade of the, uh, the uh, 20th century. Uh, we've recently restored uh, the bridge that the steam engine is, is shown on uh, because of the historic connection to this iron works. And all. The name Colebrookdale, uh, despite the fact that it's impossibly long uh, for our brochures uh, and incredibly difficult for our tourists to pronounce, the name Colebrookdale uh, is legendary uh, and looms large within industrial history. Uh, it is the name of the world's first iron works, uh, which was um, uh, commissioned uh, by Abraham Darby uh, and for which um, was appropriated, the name was appropriated by a gentleman named Thomas Rudder. Uh, who was a friend of William Penn uh, and came to Pennsylvania uh, at William Penn's behest to see if an iron industry here in the colony uh, could be successful. Next slide. And, and uh, that previous slide, incidentally, was an image, a famous painting uh, of, of the original Colbertdale Iron Works in um, England. And so the answer to William Penn's question as to whether or not an iron industry, iron industry in Pennsylvania uh, could be successful was yes, uh, and Rudder's Colbrookdale works uh, was the first of a host of firsts in the iron industry, in the iron world, that unfolded in the area along what would become the Colbrookdale Railroad's tracks. Uh, those firsts included the first iron works uh, in the New World uh, and the first iron bridge in America uh, built in Pottstown. Uh, those same industries or their successors would later go on to build uh, famous bits of, of infrastructure in America, including uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and around the world, including the Panama Canal gates. Next slide. So the railroad was really built to connect the ore fields, uh, the iron foundries, the iron forges, and the iron furnaces um, that were through the valley of the Manitoni and the Ironstone uh, to the outside world. And our connection to the outside world uh, was then as it is today in Pottstown, uh, originally with the Reading Railroad, and now today with Norfolk Southern. And these historical images give you a sense of the railroad as it grew and matured uh, over time. And, and though it was built specifically for iron, the railroad really became a lifeline uh, and a character defining feature uh, of life in the region for a century and a half. Uh, so you can see some of the stations and uh, just some of the, the very pastoral scenes um, uh, that were taking place in the, uh, along what was otherwise a, an industrial railroad. Next slide. And I, I love this image because so often we think of, of railroad history and industrial history on a grand scale. And, and what often gets left behind are these quiet moments of the role of this railroad line um, in the lives of the people who lived here, including my great grandparents. And so here's a, here's a picture of what no doubt must have been the first railroad, uh, the first bike to be used on the railroad, uh, this picture being taken in, in Bartow um, many, many years ago. And the next slide, please. And then this picture, this probably is my absolute favorite picture of life along the Colebrookdale in, in the earlier era. Um, this, we, we know exactly where this, um, this picture was taken. It was taken at a location called Red Shale, about midway down the railroad line between Boyertown and Pottstown, and, and in a place called Ironstone. Uh, and Ironstone was one of several whistle stops along the line uh, where uh, just out of view uh, in, in the background, there would have been a large semaphore signal, tall semaphore signal uh, that passengers could raise uh, that would bring passing trains to a stop. Ironstone was also one of several locations uh, where farmers would bring uh, produce uh, and milk uh, uh, to the station uh, where it would be picked up by passing trains for delivery to Reading Terminal in Philadelphia. Uh, those same trains would pick up the mail in Reading Terminal and deliver it to the stations along the line. And you can actually see behind uh, the young lady who's sitting um, adjacent to the station, you can see the milk cans that are lined up to be picked up by the train. Um, and uh, the, the, the image of the fireman sitting on the back of the tender of the locomotive, and it's a, what's known as a camelback locomotive specifically designed to burn anthracite coal. So it's absolutely pure Reading Railroad history. Uh, but the image of the fireman taking his lunch on the coupler so much reminds me of uh, the Hooterville Cannonball and, and um, uh, what was the TV show that the Hooterville Cannonball was on? Petticoat Junction. Um, and so I, I just, um, it's just such a great slice of life. 
The, the other thing that's interesting about this is that the Culbertdale also served as a way for school children to get back and forth uh, to school if they lived along the line. And so uh, the notes that accompany this picture indicate that the woman is waiting for her children to arrive on, back from school on an afternoon train. Um, today, nothing remains of the station, although we found the driveway that leads to Red Shale Road that, that climbed the hill to the station, and the base of the semaphore signal is still there. It, it is in the back of my mind, because of this picture, uh, a goal someday to recreate the station and to put it, put it back, as, as you see in this image. So the old familiar tale of railroad woe unfolded here in large part the same way as it did pretty much everywhere else. Um, and thanks to changes in the, the economies, uh, changes in uh, production and delivery systems, uh, and uh, the advance of uh, alternative forms of transportation, uh, the railroad uh, fell in hard times. It was nearly abandoned uh, several times. Um, and as the slide indicates, the, you know, this, this railroad uh, as an abandoned resource is an attractive nuisance, and, and we saw it truly as a, as a missed opportunity. So the tale of Railroad Road changed a little bit um, here in, in Boyertown. Abandonment would not be, uh, an abandonment was not going to win on the Colbertdale, uh, thanks to Berks County and Boyertown, uh, where we chose to do it a little differently, a lot differently. The community banded together uh, and came up with a vision plan for something else. Uh, and so. Uh, you can see uh, very early on, this is from, from back in uh, 2005, uh, we came up with an idea of how to take what was essentially a dead railroad and bring it back to life, knowing that it had tremendous, tremendous history, it connected communities that were working hard to reinvent themselves, and how could this resource, if lost, uh, would never return, how do we take something like this and, and bring it back to life? Uh, and so we entered into a period of planning uh, and fundraising. And the result was the creation of the Colbertdale Railroad Preservation Trust. Um, and the Colbertdale Railroad Preservation Trust is a, is a nonprofit, uh, and it partners with the Redevelopment Authority of the County of Berks, which owns the railroad track, uh, and the Eastern Berks Gateway Railroad, which is our for-profit subsidiary uh, that operates freight. Uh, and together, we're, we're working on a community and economic development project that creates jobs uh, and teaches vocational and life skills, uh, particularly to persons uh, at risk uh, within our community. So uh, over the course of the past um, seven years, on average, uh, the railroad has brought $8 million uh, of income uh, of economic boost to the local community that was based on the 2020 study. Uh, that same study projected that as the railroad grows and brings new coaches uh, uh, into service uh, and makes some of the other advancements that we'll talk about that are uh, on track for the future a little later in this presentation, uh, that number, that $8 million annual number will increase to $16 million a year. Okay. So this gives an idea of some of the, the, the key dates in terms of the railroad uh, its creation and its rebirth. So it was finished in 1869. Uh, in 2007, it was proposed for abandonment. Um, and, and those of you familiar with the process will recognize that once a railroad is proposed for abandonment, it is a significant challenge to prevent that abandonment. It is a federal process. Um, and it is very hard to fight and win that. And I will say thanks to the leadership of Berks County, thanks to the leadership of Boyertown, uh, and the partnership with Montgomery County, the story was different here. Uh, and this is truly remarkable. Uh, in the same way that the railroad itself is unique and superlative in its history, the fact it was saved and the growth that it's had since it was saved is also unique and superlative in many ways. And so all of the progress that you'll see in the future slides has really unfolded over the course of the past nine years. I want to point out um, that in 2020, we've had a really wonderful recognition, 2020 being only seven years into the revival of this uh, project, that we took a railroad that was essentially dead um, and brought it back to life thanks to the work of largely volunteers and donors. And in 2020, um, USA Today named us the number two heritage railway in all of North America, just an incredible honor. Uh, and and um, I, but su such that I really wanted to point it out in this, this presentation. So why don't uh, we take the, the next few moments and give some highlights about some of the work over the course of the past uh, nine years, some of the progress. Again, largely driven by donations and powered by our amazing volunteers um, whose dedication and talent really showcase uh, the resources, the human resources that we've had here in, in Berks County. So I always start with rail car restoration because um, this, these are some of the best sort of before and afters that, that, that we have to offer. 
Um, one of the advantages of starting with nothing, with a railroad that really uh, is, is very close to, to dying, uh, is that you've got their freedom to create from scratch. Um, and so in the very beginning, uh, we started out with a vision to create something that like the history of the railroad, and like the unprecedented nature of the effort to save it, was also superlative, something that you couldn't see or experience anywhere else. Uh, and so we decided that, that we were going to take what we had and create um, uh, a recreated palace car experience. So the palace cars were the finest railroad cars anywhere in the world, uh, the great ocean liners, uh, inland ocean liners of their day. And there's no place in the country to be able to experience a ride on a palace car train. So a train as you would have ridden in 1890 between Chicago and Los Angeles or from New York to Chicago. Can't do that anywhere, except you can do it here. Uh, the ride's a little shorter, but you can still ride in, in, in those trains. And so uh, what many of the awards that we've gotten uh, are for our train car restoration. Uh, so this is about four of a car that was built uh, in, in the early 1920s. And the next slide shows from that to this. And I think the quality of craftsmanship, the love that, that uh, our fellow Berks Callians have, have lavished on, on this car and the others that you will see just really speaks for itself. One of the things that our passengers really enjoy uh, is the fact that this car, our, our parlor car, has a piano on board. Uh, and so you can enjoy the piano. And at the far end of the car, uh, you can see a bar. Uh, another, another slide will show that. There you go. There's the bar. Um, and so that's also a great joy uh, to the passengers on board. So you can sip a historic cocktail uh, listening to period music in, in a car that is really quite uh, palatial. The details make the difference. Uh, the details in design, uh, the Victorian and Edwardian era are very difficult to replicate faithfully. You can see them done very poorly in many places, uh, but, but to see them done well, faithfully and accurately, uh, is rare, and, and, and we do that here, and I'm, I'm quite proud of it. We have a full-time designer on staff um, who, who works to, uh, to faithfully recreate these designs. Details also make the difference in experience. Uh, we have a full-time hospitality manager on staff who manages our public excursions, including our, our excursions with Santa Claus, and you can imagine how magical it is to ride a Victorian slash Edwardian era train uh, with a Victorian era Santa Claus. Um, we also do a lot of special events, including weddings, uh, and, and the railroad, uh, and particularly the train cars, make a great venue for that. So if you're going to replicate a, a train ride in the Grand Era, there, there's, there's two aspects that you, you, you really need to, 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 two performative aspects that you need to cover. Uh, one is an overnight accommodation. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, uh, the other one is dining. Uh, in order to do dining in the grand, uh, elegant tradition, uh, you need a dining car. Um, we didn't have one. Um, and uh, you'll understand the ways in which we work miracles when I tell you that the thing that you're looking at on the slide right now is our dining car uh, prior, to, prior to its restoration work. So our, our vision was to recreate uh, a first-class dining car, really the only one you'll, not just in Pennsylvania, but frankly anywhere, uh, a first-class dining car of the Edwardian period. And so we took that rusty hulk that you saw on the previous slide and began to work on it. Our, our restoration is really iterative. Um, this is the state of the car now. Um, and um, for as beautiful as this car is, this car is about halfway through its restoration. Uh, the exterior has been restored, all the systems have been restored. But as I mentioned, we're largely donation driven and volunteer powered and we need the seats. Um, and so this car uh, will be restored further over time and each year we take out a service and do a little more work. Um, this car's interior is frankly uh, temporary. It's beautiful, but the actual historic interior uh, is under creation now and will be restored over time. Um, and so uh, apart, from the, uh, apart from us, uh, the expression, uh, they don't build them like that anymore, really truly does exist. We, we, we are doing things that haven't been done in the railroad industry in over 100 years, one of which is creating these historic interiors. And so these are elements of that dining car that we're looking at that will be installed over time. This is a stained glass dome that uh, will cover the entry area. And so we, we've really become masters of, of woodwork and stained glass, much in the same way, uh, if on a much, much smaller scale uh, as Pullman and Barney and Smith and the other great uh, train car manufacturers of an earlier era. This is a, this is a car that was in um, uh, Cranbrook, British uh, Columbia. And um, one of the, this is, this is sort of the, the, the apex of the car builder's art where you see this beautiful stained glass half dome, uh, Art Nouveau columns, it's wonderful upholstery. And this 
Car Museum, or this uh, museum is the only place where you can see this very finest example of these beautiful stained glass domes. Only two of them are known to exist of the thousands that were once in service around the country. However, um, the, the word of the Colbertdale's train car restoration has spread far and wide, uh, and we were notified of a historic car that was about to be uh, demolished in Minnesota. And we went out to explore it, and underneath the drop ceiling, we found this, which is the third of those historic domes. Uh, so we traveled out to Minnesota and salvaged as much as we could from the car uh, and, and brought it back to Pennsylvania with the idea of reinstalling in our historic dining car. So there you see that same beautiful dome um, and uh, it, it's ready for installation in our dining car. And truth be told, this is actually not that dome. Um, as a testament to, to the, to the uh, fortitude of our volunteers and our craftspeople, uh, our stained glass lady, Anita, does amazing work. I said to her, Anita, we found this dome in, in Minnesota. We're bringing it home, 1,500 piece stained glass dome, five feet across. And you know, will you restore it? She said, yes, I'll give it a shot. I've never worked on anything that big. I'll give it a shot. And I said, thanks. And by the way, the car that it goes in and the car that it originally went in had two domes. Can you make another one? And she says, you're killing me, but she did it. And so this is actually the replica. So, so now we have, we have both domes. So um, one of the other advantages uh, of our, our railroad project basic creating things from scratch is we take pieces of railroad infrastructure, pieces of railroad equipment that are basically at the end of their usable lives. And they've got very little historic fabric left and, and we use them as a blank canvas. And so that blank canvas gives us the opportunity to correct problems that existed in that grander era that we're looking to portray, one of which is accessibility. If you're in a wheelchair of any kind, trains of this period are almost impossible to access. Um, and so we took this dead railroad car and we began a process to completely modify it to accommodate wheelchairs of all sizes. And so you see that great big door? Uh, that great big door would have been on a car that looked a lot like this, that's known as a combine car, a combination car, um, but none existed. And so we took the opportunity to recreate this dinosaur from the past, but for a different purpose. Uh, and that different purpose uh, with that big door allowed us to, uh, to accommodate wheelchairs of all sizes. And so uh, you'll see the car in its, in its various levels of uh, construction uh, and then a close up of, of the big door. And uh, it's besides recreating a design that was lost to time, uh, this car also allowed us through this big door to be able to serve a population that is otherwise often uh, merely accommodated as opposed to welcomed. So along, along with the, the history of, of traveling around the country to find pieces of dead railroad cars to bring back to life, uh, among the more notable um, es escapades that I've been on was I got a call um, that a, a very famous um, railroad car manufacturer known as the Wagner Palace Car Works, which is Pullman's greatest competitor, um, that, that there's only roughly 10 or so known cars to exist anywhere in the world from the Wagner Car Works. And um, <clears throat> a place in Ohio, uh, a farm in Ohio, um, had this great big behemoth uh, under a tarp. Uh, and it was rumored within the railroad world that when that tarp blew off, the thing underneath it might be historically significant. Well, you know, only a dreamer looks at a car like that and sees historical significance, but I traveled, or, or a, a wing nut, I'm probably in both. So I, I traveled to, uh, to Ohio to look at this car. Uh, and in fact, when we walked in, um, we recognized that yes, in fact, this is a, a long lost Wagner Palace car. Uh, unfortunately, the car had collapsed. Um, and so we went out with our team of volunteers and spent several weeks in uh, Ohio salvaging uh, the car uh, and taking all of the woodwork that we can find. And you can see just how, how truly exquisite uh, some of that woodwork is uh, in, in these slides. This is stuff that could not be replicated uh, today uh, in terms of both the, 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 uh, the nature of the wood, woods that are no longer available, and the quality of the woodwork. So trains have been a passion of mine for a long time. John can uh, attest to that um, from the stories he's heard, most of which unfortunately are true. Um, when I was in college, I um, read that this really historic car uh, was available and, and likely to be scrapped. Uh, I was in college in New York and had um, no money to my name, as most college students uh, don't. And um, I, I nonetheless acquired this car for a dollar uh, because I didn't want it to be scrapped. This was long before I had a railroad or any, and just only the hope someday maybe I would. Um, and I, and uh, this is a picture of me 
with more hair um, sitting inside the, uh, the train car in the configuration that I bought it in uh, for the whopping sum of a dollar, which is probably overpaying. Um, then, you know, 15 years later, um, when the Culbervale project came to life, um, uh, I realized I had a home for the car. Uh, and so we brought it to Boyertown. And when those of you who were on the call who, who were here that day uh, may remember it had no wheels. Um, and so we had to find wheels in a different state. They came from Maine and the wheels from Maine and the car from New Hampshire met each other for the first time in Boyertown. And when we went to go sit the car on the wheels, they didn't fit. So this car sat up on blocks for roughly eight years uh, while we figured out how to, how to make it fit and then how to add brakes and just about every other fixture, appurtenance, and appliance that a car would require. Um, I am sort of thinking of maybe calling this car uh, Ahab because I felt like I was Ahab with the whale trying to bring this thing back from the dead. But the next slide will show you why we did it. That's what the car looks like today. So we had to make custom lights. Uh, these lights were made from parts. Uh, and this is again, a testament to the quality of design and construction. Um, you can see over the next few slides, some of the stained glass work and, and some of just the, the love and attention that's lavished on these cars that you just frankly cannot see anywhere else. So um, <clears throat> before the cars are restored uh, and you've gotten a sense of what they look like before they're restored, um, the, the cars take anywhere from two to 10 years to restore and anywhere from a quarter of a million to three quarters of a million dollars to restore. But we are an inventive and ingenious railroad and Michelle who's sitting uh, alongside me who you'll hear from in just a few moments is incredibly creative. Uh, and uh, she and our designer and our wonderful volunteers um, figured out a way to be able to allow us to run a car that's not fully restored and make money and delight the public. Um, and, and that is that these abandoned train cars, which look spooky, uh, are rethemed as haunted cars, uh, whether that's haunted haunted or haunted Christmas, uh, and early this year, we did a number of Harry Potter themed trains uh, and the context of a not fully restored haunted train car is, is just a perfect, uh, a perfect place for this kind of theme. And so uh, we were very pleased with how that, that worked this year. Um, many people are surprised to learn that the Colbertdale Railroad carries freight. Um, we are a uh, transloading freight railroad, which means that we bring in products from the outside world and we, we transload them to trucks. You can see the conveyor in the, in the upper photograph on the left, uh, or we bring in products on trucks and transload them into railroad cars. Um, next year, we'll actually have our first online customer. We're doing the expansion of the railroad, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, to put the tracks back down where they used to go to serve a couple, uh, some, some online customers. Um, our freight operations. Uh, are an important part of our workforce development and skills training um, uh, mission. So uh, this year, if you drive through Boyertown, you'll see that we're building a new transload yard here in Boyertown. Um, the first phase is just about nearing completion next week. Uh, the second phase will take place in 2024. Um, and in the, uh, the next couple of years, we'll actually, uh, as I mentioned, be putting in some additional track and building to New Berlinville and there'll be a new transload uh, site in New Berlinville, second transload yard. This work is important for Berks County businesses because as you can imagine with the price of uh, diesel fuel today, that every shipment that can be made on rail that's currently on truck costs that shipper more. Uh, the rail transportation, uh, particularly with today's fuel prices is incredibly uh, more competitive uh, and saves a lot more money uh, for Berks County businesses than shipping by truck, particularly long haul. So uh, one, one of the pieces that, again, is, is really quite incredible about what the Colbertdale Railroad is doing, um, you, you rarely hear about railroads building track uh, and extending railroad lines anymore, railroads of any size. We're about to do it. Um, we're going to be extending the railroad line from its current terminus um, in Boyertown, uh, two miles to the north to New Berlinville. Uh, that extension will take us to um, a foundry. Uh, that uh, is here in Boyertown. Actually, two foundries that are here in Boyertown will be able to serve them with products um, and also uh, to a new transload yard right along Route 100. One of the, the most important things that I think that uh, we do from a community and economic development standpoint are the improvements that we're making in both of our communities, um, particularly in our terminal communities, uh, Boyertown and Pottstown. In Boyertown, which is the location that most of our trains depart from, 
uh, we inherited a railroad yard that looked a lot like uh, in the next slide uh, this. Uh, this is this is what was there in, in the beginning. Um, all of that grassy area had originally been a railroad yard. And you can see the old railroad ties and rail piled up on the left hand side of the slide. This was really the head of the creature when we took over the railroad. This is where all the freight was transloaded. This is the original site of the Boyertown station shown in an earlier photograph. Uh, and as part of the abandonment, before we could actually jump in and save the railroad, all of this was ripped up. A tremendous loss because it meant uh, it was basically like cutting off the head of the creature and hoping it'll survive. There was no place to transload freight. There was no place to board passengers, none of it. So, so a major part of our effort uh, was to redevelop the area. And if you could go back to the previous slide, you can see there's a map of the area where right now we're standing somewhere right in where they're parking, right, right in that area is where that picture was taken. Uh, and, and you can see the plan for redevelopment really is a, a multi-block plan that goes both to the north uh, up to um, on the other side of Philadelphia Avenue. You'll see some, some photographs of that in the central core of the railroad yard uh, and then also to the south down along Paris Street. So a, a, a fairly massive uh, restoration and, and, and um, uh, reconfiguring of the yard. I'm going to have a couple of slides. And this is a, another slide of, of what the railroad yard looked like again when we first took over, just a, a real mess in town. And now the next few slides will show some of the images of what the yard is, as, as it's being reborn look like. So um, if, if we might go back just to the previous slide for a second, much of the railroad yard uh, is being uh, reconfigured utilizing historic infrastructure from around Pennsylvania. Uh, and so we're, we're gathering pieces of the built fabric from um, all over Pennsylvania, bringing it back here for restoration, installation, and interpretation. So historic gates built in Pittsburgh in the 1860s. Uh, that's what you see in this picture. Gas lamps that came from Philadelphia uh, from the 1880s uh, that are actually run on real gas, thanks to UGI. Uh, the bricks that you see in the next few slides are all uh, from streets uh, throughout Pennsylvania, former street bricks and also from train stations around Pennsylvania. And you can see some of the curb work that we're doing, our little station building uh, that actually started life as a garden shed with a tower and a bunch of gingerbread added. Hard to underestimate the importance of gingerbread. Uh, <clears throat> some more of the bricks. Fountain that's underway uh, to be restored as, the, as the really a uh, center of the community. Uh, and these pictures are actually fairly old. We've done a lot more work since then, but I wanted to show some of the progress. This is on the north side of Philadelphia Avenue. Uh, making this a, a, a center that was our original, originally our first ticket booth. We've since given that to the community with the idea that they can run uh, community events there. This slide's important because I want to show you some of the mastery that our craftsmen have done with brickwork, how, how beautifully they've laid these bricks. And important to the folks on this call, these bricks actually came from the Pennsylvania Railroad Station in Reading. They were under a tarp under the Penn Street Bridge on the Rack campus. Uh, I discovered them when I was on a bike ride on the Schuylkill River Trail a number of years ago, I recognized them for what they were, and Rack was kind enough to, uh, to donate them to us, and we went up and brought them home. Some other improvement work that we're doing in a small park area uh, in Boyer Town. Uh, there's our doodle bug, built in 1930 in Philadelphia, uh, and we hope to someday use that for regular service to Pottstown on a daily basis. So some more pictures of the improvements, the various uh, areas where we're, we're putting in brick. <laughs> I want to point out the, the gas lamps. These gas lamps uh, are also very historic. They are open flame lamps uh, installed by UGI and they originally uh, were built at the Glasgow uh, Works in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. So a little bit of in international infrastructure. Another shot of our stationary under development. Uh, and for, uh, new for this year, we, we've actually uh, built a uh, small beer garden uh, in partnership or sponsored uh, through, through Yingling and the feature Yingling products. We're very glad to do that. Uh, and we're actually running a cafe out of a 1913 uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad uh, baggage car, which isn't shown in this picture. So if you choose to come out, you can have a, a drink or a coffee out of our baggage car and enjoy the beer garden. We're also seeking sponsors for gas lamps. I apologize for this shameless plug, but if you'd like to have your name uh, on history, we put your name on a, on a brass plaque on the side of one of the gas lamps. I'm going to take this opportunity to, to, to switch with uh, Michelle Barrett, who's the director of our education programs and also the director of our rail bike program to talk a little bit about those two pieces of our project. Great, thank you. So I, um, one of the things that I get most excited about at the Colbertdale Railroad is the opportunity to be the creative that I am. And so when I come up with crazy ideas and toss them to Nathaniel on occasion, he says, sure, let's 
give it a go. And so uh, my husband and I were up at Lake George. I didn't come up with the idea of rail bikes. Nathaniel showed you at the very beginning of this presentation, the first bicycle that was on a railroad track um, long and back in the day when someone needed to get quickly on site and off site. Um, they actually attached some additional steel wheels to a bicycle and they pedaled where they needed to go up and down the track. Um, over the course of many years, um, different people have refined the design. We are currently in the mode of refining a design and coming up with an all new rail bike design to meet the needs of the people that we deeply value. And so this rail bike is a, a people powered adventures into nature. And what I'm really excited about is, um, I don't, many of you might not know my background, but walking, biking, advocacy, outdoor education are really a passion of mine and have long been. Um, so the idea that I get to tie bicycling, education, outdoor recreation, and um, the train together all into one, one package that really you can see here is a small little, <laughs> a small little vehicle is really very exciting to me. Um, but uh, in 2023, we will be the only U.S. manufacturer of what will be an all-access rail bike, and we're going to make it right here. We've been blessed with an engineer who's brilliant and designing, who's working with us and, and turning over to us um, the design plans and the engineering so that we can hire people who are at risk. Um, and that includes up to 80% of people with autism who have graduated from college with degrees, who are intelligent, specialized, capable people who maybe don't make it through the very social aspects of job interviews. Um, and so we already have a, a $25,000 grant from an organization called Next for Autism to build our workforce development program and to begin hiring people and getting job coaches to enable those folks to be able to help us in the manufacture and resale of bikes. Sure, he had someone to flick his slides. I got to do them myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the rail bikes were very excited um, to have the support of the community partners of the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Bureau of Recreation, in support of the Schuylkill Highlands Mini Grant Program um, that is administered through the National Lands Trust. We also have support through the Pottstown Area Health and Wellness Foundation and the general private donors, Carl and Sylvia Landis, among others. Um, but when we started last year, uh, on May 1st, 2021, I started to put out press releases in March with the idea that it would take some time for media to get back to me, ask for pictures, ask to could they come and see it, or maybe ask me a few questions on the telephone. And that next morning when I woke up, and this was an Oprah moment, I don't know if any of you know, when she put something on her television show, you'd better be ready for an onslaught of calls because they're coming. We woke up the next morning. I had so many email and telephone calls in March um, that before that week was out, all of May for the season was sold out. June was sold out and we were beginning to sell out July and August. And in that couple of months, we won the best of Philly award um, for our, our new program. Um, we have had, and you see here to the left of this picture, young girls coming with their Girl Scouts. The far right with the hands in the air are the PE classes from the Boyertown High School that do outdoor recreation with their PE and they came to ride our rails. We've had seniors, folks with disabilities, families and corporate excursions, um, lots of groups wanting to come, um, but also lots of individual sales. We worked in conjunction, we put out two RFPs, the Montgomery County Community College Innova Project, took on one of our speeders, which is a small little tiny work engine that runs up and down uh, the track and they are electrifying and redesigning that as a support vehicle so that it would be able to do all of the things that are necessary to do um, urgent first aid, first aid kit support along the rail in some of the more remote spaces where we are and to haul the bikes if we need to move them up and down the line. Uh, the Perky Omen School um, in Pennsburg, uh, a one young man there and his department is working on designing an electric pedal assist electric motor for our newest bikes. That's in the works now. They've highlighted us in their annual magazine and they're working in conjunction with our engineers. We also are working with Autism Workforce Development Risk, which I also already mentioned. So um, 
the mission here in what we're doing is to tie everything back to what I do in one of the many initiatives is our educational program. Uh, Nathaniel is a scholar. He comes from education and he teaches at Cornell. I have my master's degree in curriculum and instruction. I'm coming from an education and teaching background. And so I wrote a curriculum called Rails of Revolution, American Industrial Environmental Revolutions in the Secret Valley. It is a Department of Education approved education program that through the DCED EITC program, public school students receive our hands-on immersive real life learning experiences free of charge to their schools and to their families um, because of tax investors who support us. That's a picture here of one of our sponsors, a very generous at, for, through Antler Savings Bank, who provided to make possible the field trip with the kids that are, that are right there. Um, we do continue the vocational life skills training for people at risk. That also includes women in engineering and others who have less opportunity, uh, whether they're coming from communities of people of color or others who might not get the same chances that some of us do are and are amply provided uh, opportunities to do. Um, and that brings me back to Nathaniel. We log in here. So how, how are we doing time-wise? Looks like we, we have a few minutes to talk about the future. Okay. Um, So we've got a lot of exciting things happening, uh, both that are in the pipeline and that are planned for the future. The first um, that, that um, I'll talk about here is uh, next year, starting in January, we'll begin to implement um, a, ma a major improvement in the next phase of the Boyertown Railroad Yard, uh, including some uh, better accessibility improvements and the creation of an event space for community events. Uh, that is really setting the stage for a future welcome center that will be built here in Boyertown. There's an artist rendering of the current concept of the, the Regional Welcome Center. We've already begun to fundraise for that. We're still in the process of fundraising for it, but that would be located here in Boyertown um, in the historic site, on the historic site of the original Boyertown train station. Um, we've been working with the, the borough of Boyertown um, to um, address a community need that arose. Uh, many of you may remember Zern's Farmer's Market, a famous farmer's market that was located just outside of Boyertown. It was quite an institution. Um, it closed a number of years ago. Um, there's been a demonstrated need for a place to directly connect farmers uh, and their products, as well as local artisans, uh, to consumers. Uh, traditionally, that kind of market function happened uh, in railroad terminal locations. Uh, think of the Reading Terminal Market. Uh, and so we've conceded the Secret Valley Terminal, a farmer's market uh, located in an old freight station here in Boyertown. Um, and we partnered with the borough of Boyertown to do a number of grant applications for this. And so when we get the yes, you'll see a construction that happens a lot like, a lot like this. One of the projects that uh, Michelle and I are both really excited about um, is the uh, Children's Educational Grove at Colbertdale. So that original earliest iron works in all of the new world is now an archeological site uh, right along our tracks. And uh, we're, we're working to rebuild or to build new some of uh, the, some infrastructure there that tells the story of Colbertdale and the iron making uh, heritage of, of the area. We're also uh, going to be th through that talking about the, the importance and the power of wind and water uh, to, to turn iron ore into the things that built the railroad and the railroads that built the nation. Uh, so this is really an off the grid educational center that as, we're, as we speak, uh, crews are down working on uh, building the blacksmith shop uh, and the infrastructure for the water wheel uh, today. So. My favorite slide in all of them. Uh, so so uh, the, the gateway drug for trains for, for many people <laughs> like me are steam engines. Uh, and so I fell in love with the steam engine when I first saw one at Strasburg and it's been, it's been a romance ever since. Uh, and so it was a goal uh, from the very beginning to get a steam locomotive, but um, you, you have to prepare, you have to prepare for one. Uh, and so we spent the first seven years really getting the place ready, getting the infrastructure in place to get a steam engine. Uh, and this is our first steam locomotive. Uh, it's not yet in operation, but uh, we're, we're shooting for fourth quarter 2023. And this was provided through the, the kind support of uh, Stephen and Joanna McGuire, uh, whose foundation uh, purchased the locomotive. I mentioned daily service to Pottstown, that's still the goal. Um, we've got some major track improvements coming. Uh, as part of the extension of the railroad line, we're gonna be upgrading the track uh, to modern standards to accommodate um, uh, modern freight cars, 
That's an incredible uh, upgrade from uh, the current condition of the track. And when that is completed, uh, we think that we'll be able to offer regularized daily service to Pottstown using the dual bug, so we don't need to, to fire up the whole train. Uh, Caitlin is on the call. This is uh, something that she and the, and the great folks from Alvernia, thank to, thanks to a connection with John Weidenhammer, um, studied for us. Um, so I mentioned that there are two sort of performative aspects to the, the great train experience. One is dining. Uh, the second is an overnight experience. Uh, and thanks to some uh, of the work at Al, uh, with the folks from Alvernia uh, under Caitlin's direction, um, we've done a study to be able to indicate what we would need to do to be able to provide overnight experiences on the Cobra Dale. So that's something in planning uh, for the future. Pottstown Station, this is a schematic of Pottstown Station. The construction started in 2019 in Memorial Park in Pottstown. Uh, it largely paused uh, during the pandemic, uh, but we recently received word that we've got the funding necessary to complete the station uh, and construction will start in 2023. Here's some photographs of the building uh, in, its, in its current state. It's sort of half, half built. Um, and uh, some pictures of the attractions immediately adjacent to the station, the carousel at Pottstown, Pottsgrove Manor, the Iron Master's house for Pottsgrove, um, the Schuylkill River Trail nearby, and the Manitoni Green Miniature Golf Course, all within walking distance of the station. And so um, if you looked at the picture of me earlier on uh, in, in sitting in that train car and, and, and there was no gray hair and a whole lot more hair and, and, and whatnot, and sometimes I have to ask myself, what, why do we do all of this? Um, we do it for our communities, uh, and, and, um, but, but more so, uh, if, if you go to the next slide, this is why um, the, the wonder uh, that you see uh, in the eyes of the children who ride our trains and how excited they are when the train pulls in. Uh, that's what makes it all worthwhile day in and day out. Uh, and in part, I know that because many years ago, that was me. Uh, and so I fell in love with the train. Um, uh, and, and I'm looking to bring that same joy uh, to future generations of people. So thank you very much for your, your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm sure Michelle Great. is too, that you might have. Nathan, you can tell, Nathan, you can tell that uh, the enthusiasm from that picture is still present in you. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really great. I mean, you can just feel the energy. Um, thank you. One of the things that, you know, several of us, John and I and some other people are involved in bring, trying to bring passenger trains back. And there's a lot of discussion about transportation, transit oriented development. And what what impact has the Colbrookdale Railroad had on and the restoration project? You've, what impact has it had on Boyertown? Is it significant? Does it, has it changed the community? Well, um... <clears throat> I think uh, pro probably best to, to let the folks from, from uh, Boyertown and building a better Boyertown, the Main Street organization, answer that. But I do ask them regularly, how, how, how are we doing? You know, what, what, what has the impact been that you've seen? What things can we do better? And um, when, when we last touched base, we, we understand that uh, Boyertown has seen the growth of a number of businesses and 13 new business starts. Um, all of which uh, the Main Street manager at, at the time directly attributed to the coming of the railroad, not just the, uh, the, the business that the railroad was bringing, but also the promise and the optimism uh, and the investor confidence inspired by uh, the investments in the railroad. Uh, and so uh, we've seen a, a number of businesses open up right around the railroad yard that um, if you look at those pictures of before we started, those buildings are basically abandoned and now they're um, there's a pub and a brewery and a coffee shop and a number of other businesses right right, right in the area around the railroad. And then, of course, many of the, the infrastructure improvements that uh, were, were depicted are intended to take those railroad passengers and direct them into the community to become diners or museum goers or theater goers um, or, or, or overnight guests at the local B&B. So we, we, we know that there's been an impact. We know it's uh, an impact in the millions of dollars. Um, and we, we know that we're poised to, to grow that. Uh, our impact in Pottstown has been, been less than the impact in Boyertown, mostly because the activities that, that we have done have largely centered in Boyertown. Um, but with the completion of Pottstown Station and also um, our, uh, the, the, the growing volume of restoration work that we're doing centered at our restoration shop in um, uh, Pottstown, 
uh, we, we know that that uh, economic impact is also poised to increase. What I would like to add to that, and so for impact, um, broad reaching is that in the education, outdoor education center and what we're doing with the rail bikes and workforce development, we have a signed agreement with several partners. And one of those partners is the YWCA of Pottstown. If you're familiar with the work they're doing, I mean, the growth of there is phenomenal, but their outreach directly into the Pottstown School District and, and working in the school, um, but also their middle school programming, their daycare and their child care center programming, their second language, their adult education classes. They're, they own multiple buildings now. I think they own five full large structures in Pottstown, but of course they reach down into Norristown, which is a little further out. Um, but their partnership is to uh, join with us and to do the educational programming at the Children's uh, Outdoor Education Center, because in particular in COVID, but they found that, that no matter how much they provide facility and building and structure, they still don't have enough space for all that they could offer. And in partnership with us, bringing their programming directly to our site is something that they're interested in doing and gives them more opportunity to grow. That partnership also includes Birds Nature and the Y and the SRI uh, or the Science and Research Institute that Adele Shade leads um, up in the center of Berks County. And so we're just really excited about bringing those partnerships in and our facility and our space gives them an opportunity to reach populations here that they find that they are not otherwise reaching. Okay, to reach. Now that's that's great stuff. Um, how important is the freight rail service to the passenger rail service? Is there does one support the other? They're they're really legs, different legs of the same stool, uh, and and so the uh, freight. Revenue, the, the freight traffic is incredibly uh, important to the customers who use it. Uh, from a revenue generative standpoint, at this point, it's a growing aspect of our business. Passenger is still the majority of what we do. Um, but with the, the infrastructure improvements, uh, with the, the, the new transload yard, we're already seeing an uptick in the level of interest from potential customers. And so um, over time, the freight will, will surpass uh, the passenger revenue in terms of being the, the principal driver of activity here. They can come. They can work together, collaborate on the on the line. That's right. Yeah, they, they absolutely do. Um, and um, many of the same the same bits of infrastructure and and uh, human capital that make a good freight railroad, make a good passenger railroad. There, there's significant overlap there. I've had a, a several people ask questions about events, about the beer garden and how that's worked, how the uh, brass car event worked. Do you do special costume events like you did, look like you did a couple. You want to talk about those a little bit, the special events that you do? So one of the, the magical parts of the tourist railroad is, is that particularly one like this that's been planned and executed in the ways in which ours has been planned and is being executed um, is the ability to create these vignettes that are truly out of time uh, from a different time. And, and um, we, we did a... a uh, a brass car event, which you mentioned, which is one of the, the area's largest gatherings of pre-1915 automobiles, 16 automobiles, beautiful cars, just truly works of art. And they were here in our, in our yard and, and the, the, the Cobra Dales train and the station made a perfect backdrop for that. Uh, and that was an event we actually did in conjunction with a donor appreciation uh, event that we had here. Um, the um, the rare has also been the filming location for a number of, of uh, films. Uh, the, probably the most uh, significant, at least in our experience, was one that we actually coordinated through the um, National Endowment for Humanities, uh, which told the iron making history of our, of our area. Michelle actually was the, the director for that uh, for that movie, and uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, and if you if you, you know, oh, right on cue. That's not piped in, by the way. That's a real locomotive. So, you know, so <laughs> there's a one o'clock train today, so you'll you'll hear it leaving in a few minutes. Um, the, uh, the 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 backdrops of the train with those period costumes it, it really felt as though a little bit of the Gilded Age that the, the PBS uh, TV show was here in Boyertown at least for a little while so it was very cool very cool what really cool. fantastic for folks to know too is that we're happy to accommodate where we can and how we can um, their requests for those private events so um, when you talk about the themes of the special excursions and what what can we do. Um, Nathaniel and I both 
tend to be on the imaginative, uh, creative side. So we like to say yes to a lot of adventures and then figure out how the heck are we going to do that how to do it. um yeah. but when folks come and, and they want to do something i know there was a fundraising event where they wanted to uh do a stage the robberies and rob the train um and then there have been other um themed events where folks who are looking for opportunities to do something new and creative um we work with them of course in the bounds of safety uh, but to do what is what is right for them to have a great time too i think there was a casino party on the train and, and, and others. So yes, lots of creative, cool. fun things to do. So creativity on both ends, your end and, and the uh, the customer's end. Yes. The the restoration work looks phenomenal. I mean, it, but it looks like it takes a lot of skill, a lot of talent, and frankly, some money to do that. Talk a little bit more about that. How, how, how big is that part of your operation? Do you do it just for your rail line? Do you do it for other rail lines? How many people this, do you have involved in it? Oh, um, well, we have a, a full-time designer on staff. We have a full-time project manager on staff. Uh, we have a full-time stained glass person, uh, actually not on staff, but she works as a contractor basically full-time for us. And we work with a variety of uh, local cabinet making shops uh, to, to do the work. Um, the, the time spent on a train car can take anywhere from two years if it's basically a, a rehab of what's there um, to uh, the main central car that you saw pictures of, the one that uh, I had acquired when I was in, in college, that took a better part of eight years to do. Um, and so it depends, of, it really depends upon their, their existing condition and what we hope to turn them back into. Um, but we've learned a lot. Um, we've learned a tremendous amount with each car that we've done. We've, we've been approached uh, a number of, uh, on a number of occasions about doing uh, restoration work for other railroads. And um, I, I think that's something we, we well, I know that's something we'd be very open to and would be glad to get to get into that business. I think it will be an important part of the overall business plan, just in the same way that freight and passenger is now. Um, we've got to do some some uh, additional infrastructure work, but it's in, in the plans uh, to build at the shop. Because right now, all of our restoration work is done outside, um, which again is a testament. If you can, if we can in the elements, create things that look like what I showed you in the presentation, just imagine yeah. what we would do with a, a shop. So I, I think it's going to be part of uh, something that we do into the future. Yeah. So it's in yet another area of expansion. Um, so, yeah. the, the education programs are phenomenal too. And you talked about the partnerships you have with that. If, a, if there are people interested in trying to expand that into schools, Michelle, is it get it, just get in touch with you about what to do and how to do it? That's Are right. Open to um, other... Go ahead. Um, I actually had the opportunity, my good friend and a colleague that I previously taught with in the classroom, Dan Richards, is now in charge of oh. outreach to the schools at the Berks County Intermediate Unit. And so working directly with him and working directly with the schools and contacting them myself, we want to make sure that every public school district and every public school family, so there are some public school charters supported where students are not full-time in classrooms right now, but are still enrolled in their public school. All mm -hmm. of those are eligible for this EITC program. And so just directly getting in contact with me, um, and that's just Michelle with one L at the Um, And I'm happy to coordinate field trips. Um, we already are planning a large list of requests for the spring of 2023. This is the time of year where our sponsors are renewing. And two of the three that are longstanding uh, sponsors have confirmed their sponsorship. And the third is just about ready to tell me what the gift will be this year. Um, and then we'll continue to look for new partners so that we can continue to grow the program because it only exists because of their support. That's great. So a couple of weird questions. How long does it take to do the bike uh, ride from uh, Boyer Town to Pots Potsgrove? Well, so we can't do the whole line because we have this weird little interruption in the middle called Route 100. And so we don't cross that <laughs> section of the track at all. Um, if we do an excursion out of the Boyer Town yard, um, we go down to the Pine Forge um, terminus and then we would do a return. At that point, we were coming back on train equipment on the open car pulled by the engine. Um, but now with the new design of the bikes, 
we will be able to do a ride down and a ride back. The engineering, the design, and the uh, uh, adjustments made for people of all abilities, weight, height, capable mobility needs um, is being addressed right now. That'll give full mobility, so we'll be able to do the up and back. For the past season, we've been operating directly out of what we call our Glasgow station. It's where workshop is right now and where we would operating rail bikes and that would come up to the Pine Forge turn. That was a, about a four to five mile full round trip and that was taking about an hour. So that's doable, that's doable and it's good yeah. exercise. <laughs> it's great for me, I love to be outdoors. That natural vitamin D has become particularly essential as we all figured out that it's, if we're lacking that vitamin D, we need to fix it, but that's long been well documented. Um, good outdoor education opportunities. The young people that work for me um, on the rail bikes are also um, passionate about the train, love the train, and they work either as black coats or white coats on the train. Um, they love to be on the bikes in the summer, even though it's heavy, hard work because they do multiple rides throughout the day. They say they love being outside and they love the activity. So yeah. Great. It's just a wonderful opportunity. Um, Nathaniel, I, we've got a, just a couple minutes left because I think we've actually gone over time, but I understand you had a recent visit from Bob Casey. What what brought him to uh, to take a look? Right. Uh, Senator Casey came to uh, visit the Colbert Dale uh, in celebration of a grant that the railroad recently received, uh, a Chrissy grant, a Critical Railroad Infrastructure Improvement Grant. Uh, that will be used to repair the railroad's track and bridges and bring them up to um, modern freight car standards. So uh, freight cars uh, from you know, 18, 1890 were a completely different beast than freight cars from 2022. Uh, and because of the importance of uh, that, that freight connection that I mentioned, we've got some significant upgrades to do. So while the track and bridges are safe and passable for our current use, we need to upgrade them for the railroad to become a, to remain a viable part of the national freight network. So. Senator Casey brought the good news of this uh, $14 million investment uh, that, that will, will go a long way towards doing that upgrade. Sorry about that disruption, but that, that's my passenger train, our dog. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, So as, as we end this, it, it sounds like, you know, there's some important lessons I think that we learned and transmitted to all sorts of different types of organizations. The, the importance of collaboration, uh, the importance of engaging lots of elements of the community. It seems to me one of the other very important things is to have somebody or a group of people who are dreamers about what's possible to do. I can't imagine if I had told my parents I wanted to buy a train car that had been sitting, like that train car had been sitting, what they would have said to me. So. I, I, I'm going to just well, use this rather than a question. I'm going to just use this as a thank you, Nathaniel, for your, your, your dreaming and Michelle for your dreaming about what's possible because what you guys have done is just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. And with that, folks, we will end today's program. But thank you all for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll send you the video and we'll post it. But a uh, terrific show. And if you haven't been on the Colbrookdale Railroad, you need to go at least six times next year. <laughs> Please do. We'll be glad to have you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.